This programme was produced at and first aired on MPR, Manawatu People's Radio, with support from New Zealand On Air. Kapai Irarangi Tomotu, MPR. Kia ora and welcome to Reserved Recommendations, a show about problematic faves, great trash, difficult art, and our complex relationship with art and entertainment. My name's Hugh, I'm the host, and I'd like to put in a very mild content warning for this show as a whole. Sometimes our recommendations on this show are reserved just because the thing that we're discussing is in some way not good. But sometimes there are aspects to the art or artist that may be confronting for some people. Read the episode descriptions for more information and do be aware of your listening environment. Kia ora, good evening. You're listening to Reserve Recommendations. This is a show about uh, complicated relationships with art and culture, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, this evening's guest, host uh, of the Audio Archive here on NPR, um, Eddie McEwen. Good evening. Good evening, Eddie. How's it going? Oh, absolutely fine. I'm uh, I'm rapt to be coming in here to talk about one of my favourite obsessions. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll get to the to the precise uh, obsession in a second. But but first, you mentioned that a bit unusually for how we usually do things, but but that you had like a quote that you wanted to lead things yes, off with. Yes. Um, well, this is from um, Greg Stafford, who was the um, the progenitor of what we're going to talk about, the mystical world of Glorantha, but he said, fantasy is not so much a suspension of belief as it is an acceptance of our own unconsciousness. Fantasy is as old as man, beginning back in our animal history when someone had the first abstract thought. In our Western society, empirical data and rational thought have become the touchstones of experience. This is worse than cutting off half your body. The fantastic is easily half of the universe, whether you count galaxies and nucleotides or caught a demon in a pentacle i think that's an excellent place to start <laughs> that, with. yes uh, so uh as as you kind of hinted what we're talking about today is is uh rune quest and, and by extension yes, and the world kinda, of glorantha the whole of glorantha yes so you gave me um, the the first RuneQuest book to uh, to take yep. away and have a look at. I've got it in my hand. Which there will of not be a test. <laughs> people can't hear. Um, I think the thing that that strikes me about it immediately is that it's it's an intensely uh, well realized world. Like a lot yes. of thought and energy has gone into exactly what Glorantha is like. Yes, uh, uh, there are, many people have put a lot of work over the years, but but most most notably Greg Stafford. Um, and, and the other thing which I just wanted to kind of mention before we maybe go a bit more into Greg Stafford and where this into it. whole thing came from is that the thing that that strikes me as really interesting about RuneQuest in particular as a because RuneQuest is the tabletop role playing game set yes. in Glorantha as opposed to the many other things yes, set in yeah. Glorantha yeah. that yeah. also exist um, is that uh, RuneQuest comes from the sort of early Dungeons and Dragons era yes. of tabletop role playing and so concepts like levels and hit points and that kind of uh, po- PowerPoint pools and that kind of yes. very uh, mechanistic, yeah, very very mechanistic, very gamey way of thinking about things. Really, with like roots and wargaming, yes, um, very much so. Is is very prevalent. But the thing they do in RuneQuest, which is fascinating, is that they kind of build the concept of like leveling up into the way that society you, functions. Yes, you don't so much level up yourself as you level up within. The organisation that you've made, you've joined or pledged your allegiance to. Yeah, yeah. There's this whole uh, architecture of, of different cults and organisations, yes. and and they allow you to level up within them. But they also uh, the the concept that you might um, level up to the point where you you entirely surpass normal human um, capability yes. is, is built in, and it's a thing that people like expect. Bet. Yes, and that can happen to literally anyone. They can find themselves like with demigodhood inflicted upon them rather than something that they've striven for. So um, maybe... 
maybe a good place to start here, um, going going back a step, is yeah. is when did you come into contact with uh, contact with with Gloranthra and RuneQuest, and and how did you come across it? Well, I well I started my career in role playing games playing Dungeons and Dragons, like so many people did, and that led me to um, subscribing to a magazine called White Dwarf. Now, this is back in the early eighties. So um, there wasn't a lot. Yeah, this was very much a niche hobby. And in one of the early White Dwarfs was a review of a new game, and they rated it highly. They said it was was very interesting, and it was called RuneQuest. So um, being, I think, 16, 17-year-old me, I immediately sent away for it. And this was back in the day when you couldn't just, like, order it online and it would arrive a week later, you had to accumulate um, things called international reply coupons. And you were only allowed to buy two pounds of these a week. And then you had to yeah, and you had to line up at the post office and turn your money into reply coupons. And then you had to stuff them all in the envelope and send it off across the world. And then you, what you ordered would come back surface. So you'd be waiting up to three months for this stuff. And then finally, the, I got the book in my hands and everything changed. I read through it and I played very little Dungeons and Dragons after that. I was a complete convert to RuneQuest and by extension the world that the the game of RuneQuest is set in, Glorantha, and it's been an obsession for over 30 years. So, I mean, it, the setting is is really a thing worth talking about because, mm. you know, that is that is the major point of difference between it and, and Dungeons and Dragons. Dragons, yes. Dungeons and Dragons kind of assumes, particularly uh, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, you've been playing second edition? I would have been playing second edition. Yeah. Yes. So particularly at that era, Dungeons... Well, ad- advanced Dungeons mm, and Dragons. That's, yeah. That, uh, at that point, Dungeons and Dragons basically assumes that you're generally familiar with fantasy tropes and yes. says, go and do a thing. Everyone knows what an evil wizard's castle yeah, is everyone like. Everyone knows what an orc is. Yeah. Um, there's not really a Dungeons and Dragons setting. It's just sort no, of a fantasy a, melange. Um, I call it COD fantasy because it's a bucket in which all of the fantasy tropes are thrown into and you, know, you step out of your, your like adventurer's hovel and there could be literally anything out there. So, I mean, was that the thing that grabbed you or were there other aspects to it that, that kind of blew your mind in particular? What really sold me on RuneQuest is that in RuneQuest everyone has magic. It's not just the wizards and the priests that have magic. Everyone has magic, and you get magic by your associations, uh, whether, you, whether you associate with a shaman or whether you associate with a, a priest, a particular kind of priest, or whether you associate with a wizard. That's where your magic derives from. But everyone, even the lowliest peasant, has magic in Glorantha, and you, know, you don't really want to piss that lowly peasant off because he w- probably worships an earth cult, and he'll sick an earth elemental on it. And if he doesn't, his priestess surely will. And it, it struck me as that that was an excellent way of going about it. And uh, it's, it's just such a creative concept because you know, everyone can deal with magic one way or another, and you have to. A- and that also applies to society. I mean, it's like in, in your basic rune quest, nearly everyone knows the healing spell. That means something like a broken leg is completely trivial. It'll be fixed in 10 minutes. If you don't fix it, someone else will come along and go, your leg's broken, not anymore. Um, it's, yeah, and how that would change society. I've always wondered how you know, that kind of you know, using the magic instead of the technology, but like industrial grade magic, whereas you don't get that in Dungeons and Dragons. And No, I mean, Dungeons and Dragons does have this very odd thing where because you know everyone who everyone who plays dungeons and dragons yep. plays as an adventurer you get the sense because you know other people who play dungeons and dragons yep. that adventurers are reasonably common which means because a magic yep. user is a pretty useful part of a an adventuring party that magic users also must be reasonably common, common. but yep. there's not really that flow on effect in society, it, yes. it's usually portrayed but, as being sort of vaguely medieval. Yes. Oh, yeah. And there's no, for instance, the the classic Dungeons and Dragons thing is the priest has the ability to cast a continual light spell at, at like relatively 
low level. So why don't they churn out hundreds of these things? Why are the cities dark at night when you know, e- e- even like the lowliest priest can perform that kind of stunt? Yeah, you and could, no one ever thought of it. You could say, you know, when you when you become an X level priest, you have to, you know, like a. Uh, the thing where they made uh, doctors do do placements in rural areas before yeah. they could set up a practice somewhere else. You know, you have to be the priest whose job is to live in this village and just keep the lights on for yeah, or five keep, years. Or keep churning out the holy water mm. to keep the undead at bay because you know, there's an awful lot of that. And where it comes from, nobody knows. <laughs> so, I mean... Rather than continuing to to dunk on Dungeons and Dragons, which is fun, but but not really the yeah, point Dungeons of the exercise. Dungeons and Dragons is a fine game in its own right. You know, it's, if that's what you're looking for, get out there, get down the dungeon, get some treasure, and get home again. But um, as we were saying, there, there's a lot more to Glorantha than that. And yes. and one of the other things that I noticed in in just reading RuneQuest, which as as I say, is kind of a surface level look at the world. Mm. Um, the there con- the conception of a of a fantasy world or a fantastic world is quite different from anything else. Yes. You know, there there are a couple of kind of recognizable touchstones. There are humans. Yep. There uh, there is magic that works sort of like you might expect. And there are things called elves and dwarves, but they aren't what they aren't Tolkien esque. No, that's the one. Not at all. And that's one of the great things about Glorantha is that it, it it completely breaks away from those tropes. So, and I um, not to go back to Dungeons and Dragons, but this is a bit of a slap at Tolkien. I've always thought his elves were a bit over noble, if you know what I mean. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, Tolkien had some some very specific ideas, and he would have been quite open about the, <laughs> about oh, what they were. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, I, I think one of the reasons that we've sort of alluded to that this that this world is so unique is that it's really uh, a very specific vision of this guy, Greg Stafford. And now, yes. I don't know a huge amount about him, except that he seems to have been part of the sort of slightly utopian, uh, weird fantasy, weird sci-fi, yes. shading into genuine belief in magic well, kind of hippie outgrowth thing. Well, he wasn't honest to God shaman, a Californian shaman, <laughs> and um, with everything that that entails. And Garantha is an, an outgrowth of his interest in religion and mysticism in general. Um, he actually first started writing about it in the late 60s. But the first game that that came out was a board game, an old school like hex and little cardboard counter counter pusher called White Bear Red Moon, which was like re released as Dragon Pass by um, a company called Chaosium, and um, then he got together with Sandy Peterson, and Sandy Peterson had the rule system. And Greg Stafford had the imagination and the world, so they combined the two, and hence RuneQuest. Now, I mean, the talking about the kind of the the real shamanism thing, uh, tying it to the late sixties, and and um, and also to to role playing is is interesting to me because I was when I was a kid, I was really into this guy called J. H. Brennan, mm-hmm. who is um, he wrote a few role playing games. And also uh, a fantasy, a couple of uh, fantasy series for young adults, and some fighting fantasy books. Um, okay, yes, the classic ones. Yeah, he's yes. he's responsible for the Grail Quest series. If okay, you've ever heard yeah, of those, I've heard of Grail Quest. Right. Well, that's that's this guy. His the vast majority of his writing has been uh, like New Age books on how to do astral traveling. Right. Um, and and one of his books for kids was a literal non-fiction book on how to find, track, record information about ghosts, actual ghosts, ghosts that yes. are really haunting people's houses that you as a 10-year-old with like household equipment yep, could go can, and find. You can be a ghost buster so in your spare time. It's, it's really interesting to me yep. that this early... Um, because of course that was one of the accusations hurled at role playing games yes. was that they were a gateway to Satanism. But there was actually this kind of connection there was, at the start. Yeah. Um, one of the classic ones was uh, was authentic thaumaturgy, which is a which is touts itself as a game, but also touts itself as containing real spells. Well, this, that was um, 
Isaac Bonewitz, yes. who um, he wrote a book called Real Magic, because authentic thermaturgy and real magic are kind of puns on each other, oh, yes. um, which was uh, he was like one of the few people to be given uh, a degree in magic as a practical um, art form. a practical art form by I think Berkeley um, in, in California again uh, and he wrote a book called Real Magic which I've read on um, which is a kind of lays out how he thinks magic works and how you could do it. The laws of magic. Mm. His his map of the laws of magic is a fantastic kind of 60s 70s thing because it's this weird like uh, warped Venn diagram with all of these bits <laughs> overlapping with one another. It's very hard Stuff to read. Sticking off the sides. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So, I mean, do you do you feel like that um, new agey alternative religiony thing is a, is kind of a vital component of of Glorantha? Well, the, another thing that Greg Stafford said is your gl Glorantha may vary. So it's he wasn't trying to hold to any one particular viewpoint. It's, you can you can approach Glorantha as a purely mechanistic game, or you can approach Glorantha as a purely narrative game. But it's entirely up to you know you as you know the, there's all in role playing. There's always the game master and the players, but it's also a, a, a sort of shared um, illusory space that people can go into. So whether you want to bring that in or not, it's entirely up to you. Yeah, although, I, I mean, I suppose, because um, bef the, the one bit of contact I had with, with Glorantha before um, talking to you about this was there's actually a webcomic, which I, yes. I will get to at the bit of, yep. of recommendations called Prince of Sata, which is a, a, someone's kind of story set in Glorantha. It, it t touches a lot of the bases of the classic, um, Gloranthan story, which is also the story of the Dragon Pass game, and also in RuneQuest, the se the setting given is Dragon Pass. Yeah, which um, is a pass that's inhabited by dragons, amazingly enough. But again, I mean, characteristically, dragons are not what you would expect. No. Actual dragon dragons are just phenomenally powerful things that don't actually do anything kilometers and, long they sleep under the ground mm, pretty much until and, they don't and and if you find and and in, if you encounter something that's like what uh, a general fantasy conception of a dragon mm. would be that's what's called a dream dragon, dragon. which yeah. is a sleeping dragon's dragon. dreams come, come to, to life to, come and, to physical life and yes gone to have a rampage um, which is, you know, it's it's another bit of that kind of slightly psychedelic shamanic thing. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's skewed from the what you would what you would think of as the traditional role playing tropes. And uh, now I'm just uh, not sure if I'm remembering a connection right. The, but dragons also evolve out of another species yes, sort they of? evolve out of dragon newts yeah so there's dragon newts are a, a sapient race within glorantha but they're they're unevolved dragons and they evolve through various stages and then the final stage is known as an inhuman king and that evolves into a, a young dragon and um yeah that's that's one of the reasons why glorantha exists they theorize that it's a, a staging post for for dragons to engender themselves because dragons come from outside of Glorantha, even though they were rumoured to have been involved in the creative process that engendered Glorantha. I mean, because it, it, Glorantha is also uh, again, I'm, I'm I'm hoping I'm remembering this right, but but it is canonically like a flat world. It's a lozenge that yes. is that is capped by a dome. The sky dome. Yeah. And underneath it is the underworld. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is this is a world which is fundamentally created in that sort of uh, deliberately mythic way. Yes. Yes. It is not at all like what, what like that real world. And it never pretends to be, unlike a lot of other games that we won't go back and name. <laughs> it, 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 you t it, you're taken completely out, ooh, out of Earth and placed in Glorantha. Yeah. And it's a very different, yeah, you know, it's a very different concept to the, uh, the standard role playing which basically allows you to to take what you consider to be, you know, like your, your Robin Hood med medieval society 
and on from there. Whereas Glorantha, you might be you know, like one of the characters in the group might be a a rhinoceros riding barbarian from the plains of Prax, and another one might be an earth magic worshipping peasant from the slums of Noche City, and they're and they're great concepts, and they're all equally valid. It sort of reminds me of. Um Michael Moorcock's fantasy stuff yes. in a way. I mean, he's very, uh, he has a very specific overarching cosmology as well, which which we needn't get into. Um, separate show in its own separate, right. Separate show in its own right, Michael Moorcock, um, and, and a, a, an entirely different set of reservations yes. about about his work. But um, the just in the sense that, that every time Michael Moorcock introduces a new world, it tends to be fundamentally different. Yes. Um, so you you will encounter someone who, you know, a, a passing bit character who shows up pulled on a sled by giant carnivorous cats. Yeah. Or you will find... Or riding a bear. Or, or... riding a bear, or you'll be... Um, introduced to a setting where everyone lives in um, in rolling cities. Uh, that's where that concept came from before whoever yes. it was nicked it for that other Actually, thing. Actually, you'll you'll find that in Glorantha as well. <laughs> um, but but just you know, there's there's a, a huge amount of creativity, and it's not. It doesn't yes. seem like it's too obviously derived from anything else. No, and another thing about the, the connection between Moorcock and Glorantha is that it very much drives on that law-chaos axis, where you have like the, the forces of law are trying to restrain the forces of chaos. And of course, chaos is, is generally painted as as you know, the adversary, but not necessarily evil in a way that other games paint good and evil as like, ultimate verities that you can prove with um with spells like detect good well no definitely and and one of the things that Moorcock gets into is that the idea that uh, that either absolute law or absolute chaos are as bad as one another yeah, those those are both unsustainable yes. places to to live and you can't you can't actually function as a human in either of those places that actually leads into a thing i was going to mention which is that uh there is some um, there is some discussion, and I think that there's there's some reading between the lines that you're expected to do in the RuneQuest book about the relationships between the different sentient races and yes. and and factions, yep. which is that there are uh, age old enmities between particular sentient races and factions, yes. but that these are based in uh, concrete Histo uh, or historical yeah well yeah, yeah, I, you, you didn't see me make the little finger quotes there on the radio but yes it's it, they are historical they they are they, but they are rooted in pre-time in the main yeah well so so what you have is you have historical um, maybe mythic historical but historical political or um, religious yeah. in the sense that gods are active participants in the world and some of them don't get on with the, with each other. Uh, at um, all. Those, those are the drivers for conflict between races, yes. which feels to me like it's a side swipe at... Uh, maybe not a side swipe, but it's an attempt to dodge the situation where in some fantasy role-playing games you have races with all of the connotations yep. of that yes. word um who are inherently evil yes and um, therefore can be slaughtered out of hand by those which are good yeah yeah and and that's that's a very troubling concept uh, yes. and and you also have you know uh and and Tolkien did this as well you have um Race. White is good, dark is bad. Oh, yeah, that, that's that's, a, there is that, that about that, it as well. That, that's a dangerous one, yeah. Um, I was thinking also of the thing where even um, nominally good races, so elves and dwarves, 
don't get on, but it's it's yeah. like it's just assumed that the races are somehow fundamentally incompatible. Compatible, yes, very much so. Well, because they are different from the the, the standard viewpoints. The the elves, for instance, are um, literally intelligent tr- plants that that walk around. Um, like one of the species um, hibernates during the winter because they're um, deciduous. Whereas they have, and they have to be guarded by their evergreen brethren during this time. And the dwarves, um, like individualism amongst dwarf society is a heresy because the dwarves believe that they are all cogs in the world machine which is currently broken and needs to be fixed. Whereas trolls just want to eat things. The, the main problem that dwarves have with trolls is trolls find them completely delicious. <laughs> But again, you know, the trolls are are a sentient faction who yes. have um, reasons for behaving the ways that they do and a patron deity who is an important part of the uh, cosmology. Oh, uh, I have the figurine right here. I'm, I'm going to have to take a photo of all of the yes. uh, props that the, Eddie brought yeah. in uh, so, so there can be the uh, the show post image on Facebook. But, but, yeah, but, I have here Kai Galaitor, the mother of all trolls, and she is a thing. Crikey dick, so she is. <laughs> and, uh, and surrounded by little worshipful trolls, trolls as well. yes. And she is a fantastic and like, and the other thing about it is in RuneQuest the game, all of these races are available as player characters. Any anything with an intelligence is specifically allowed. It's it's down to the, the game master to say, No, you cannot be a dragon, no, you cannot be a centaur, no, you cannot be a minotaur, but there's nothing in the rules to stop you from being any of those things. One of my the, the high points of my role playing career in any game was a RuneQuest campaign I ran, which was an entirely troll campaign. Everyone played trolls. They had a whale of a time. It was great. It was um, it, it went for longer than pretty much any other campaign I've ever run, <laughs> and and people kept coming back for more. And I mean that's that's interesting in terms of uh, I guess what you would think of as, as kind of ongoing influence in terms of things that exist in the world, because that's very much the way that uh, the, uh, the concept of the, of the horde and the factions therein yes. are treated in things like um, World of Warcraft. Right. Where... Um, which drives from Warhammer. Yeah. Which stole a large number of its ideas from RuneQuest. <laughs> Well, so we can maybe uh, continue talking about that stuff in a second. We are coming up about on the halfway mark. So uh, we'll just stop briefly for a break and we'll be back in a second. Support this show and others like it by giving a donation. For more information, go to www.mpr.nz forward slash donate. And you're back on Reserved Recommendations. This is a show about uh, complex relationships with art, uh, things you might not necessarily want to recommend to people. I think... Uh, I definitely recommend Glorantha. Yeah, I, I think... I mean, Eddie would cheerfully recommend Glorantha. The only rec- res- uh, the only reservation that I would have, having, having read uh, RuneQuest, mm. is that... Um, RuneQuest itself is very much a game of its time. I'm, yes. I'm sure it runs perfectly well, but I did skip all of the chapters There's about dice mechanics. And rolling the dice. And... Yeah, because there is a particular style of, of like late 70s, early 80s game writing and holy, holy heck, is, uh, is this that? That, absolutely. Well, it was one of the standard setters. There, mm. there were three great games of that era. There was Dungeons and Dragons, Traveller, the science fiction one, and RuneQuest. Yeah, yeah. And it was big. There were, I have a, um, a fearsomely large pile of mid to late 80s RuneQuest products at home. I was quite the collector, and by time, surprise, surprise, I still am. Um, so... Before the break, uh, oh, sorry. The other thing I would say in in terms of you know reservations is you know if uh, if fantasy and and nerdy world building are not your thing, then then this will turn you off because yep. it is someone going very deep down a rabbit hole of their own making and then publishing it for the rest of the world. Yes, 
And if you're into that, that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Um, you, you said an interesting thing before the break, which is, which I wasn't aware of, which is that uh, that the the Games Workshop people, um, the Warhammer people, yes. uh, nicked a whole bunch of stuff they, from from well, RuneQuest. They published RuneQuest in Britain I under see. their imprint. So this was before um, things like Warhammer got really big, and um, for instance, Beastmen are a big part of the Games Workshop experience, but they are lifted in the whole cloth from RuneQuest from the chaotic race of Brew, who are like animal-headed humanoids that are cast in an almost entirely adversarial role because of their worship of chaos. And their very disturbing method of propagating their race, which I will not go into here. <laughs> But I will guarantee you that you do not want to know this these things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, facts about mythological, uh, well, invented creatures. Mm, mm. So, so I mean, that's that is a huge amount of uh, of pop cultural influence then, because mm. uh, of course Warhammer and the and its various derivatives went on to become simply enormously massive. huge, simply massive, and uh, and the. Um, the influence that that then had on on games like Warcraft and World of Warcraft is is enormous. So that's kind of seeped yeah. into well, everything. Also, I've I've seen like the whole video game thing go from you had to program everything yourself and everything was recorded on cassette tapes. And if if the program wasn't loading properly, the res the the usual response was to turn the volume up. To um. You know, to my hobby has been utterly dwarfed. My hobby, you know, being tabletop games in general, but it's utterly dwarfed by video games, um, and you know, just the budget that they put into a video game these days would be like the entire budget of all of the game, the games companies that I played. Yeah, for yeah. like decades. I could, I can imagine, and and uh, that comes with with uh, a huge set of problems, which we which we <laughs> probably no. don't have time to go into. Um, but talking about uh, kind of ongoing things set in Glorantha, um, you've got several other books sitting on the tabletop yes. here. I know that there's also uh, a video game called The King, King of Dragon Pass. King of Dragon Pass. Yes, um, you know, I th played that. <laughs> this is this is a. Uh, a world that's had an incredible amount of longevity and a huge yes. amount of stuff well, in it. That's because so many people have taken Glorantha to their hearts and they've like they've gone, oh, this is material and, and here's a spot that no one else has written about and I'm going to do all the writing for that and, and you know, like, I will take on the burden of, of creating it. And the thing with you know, Greg Stafford, he, was, he had no problem with people doing that. He he would say, well, I don't particularly care for this bit, but he wouldn't stop people, and he wouldn't say that that's wrong because I say it's wrong. And that, I mean, that's kind of a, a an approach that's sort of common with it tabletop the, role playing games. Yeah, it was the complete opposite with Gary Gygax, though. Gary Gygax said, if you play even one rule differently from the way I've written it, you are not playing Dungeons and Dragons anymore. Which is a very strange thing to say. But very typical for Gygax. Because um, Dungeons & Dragons is, is notoriously house-ruled to heck. Well, it has to be. Particu <laughs> particularly at the... Um, at, at the advanced stage, you know, it was not an unbuggy game. <laughs> no. Well, the, the problem with Dungeons and Dragons is, and here we go dishing on D&D &D again, but they, when they came up with a problem in the rules, they would, in, they would invent another rule to cover that. And then when there was a problem with that rule, they'd invent another rule to cover that rule, and it turned into a self-defeating cycle. Yeah, actually, no, I remember reading that there was... Um, so famous, famously because of Jack Check. So Jack Check, yeah, fundamentalist Christian, Christian wrote uh, brief little short comics. Did one notoriously about how Dungeons and Dragons will make Dark you into, dungeons. Yeah, will we'll make you into a into a wizard and then you'll kill yourself. Yeah. Uh, and it, it received a lot of derision from um, 
from Dungeons and Dragons players because a central bit of it is that someone's killed because their cleric can't defend against a zombie. Clerics yep. can turn undead at yeah, a very a- low level. Um, and and this is this is a thing that Dungeons and Dragons players got a lot of mileage about. The the thing I discovered was that the reason that that exists is an early. A uh, friend group of Gygaxes, someone came up with this incredibly powerful vampire character mm-hmm. who just wrecked everything and was unstoppable and it was a giant pain in the bum for everybody else at the yep. table. So the entire concept of clerics being able to turn undead was specifically, specifically to designed, spike yep. this one guy who yep. was being the a pain. Are... Um, and that that is now a kind of a canonical thing that stayed there forever. Yeah, and yeah. it seems to me that there's a lot less of that. <laughs> in very little, although um, in Glorantha, worshippers of Humark can hold a vampire back by presenting their symbol, which is a cross, but um, that's a representation of Humark, the premier god of death. It's the first sword and also the reason why mortals die. Because Humark got his new toy and he wanted to try it out on something, and Grandfather Mortal said, "I'll give it a go." <laughs> <laughs> Hence, all mortals die. Now, I mean, we've we've talked a bit. I I wanted to make sure that we mentioned this thing in passing because it it tickles me. Um, we've talked a lot about the ways in which um, Glorantha is pre- presented as a fairly kind of straight. Um, it 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 takes itself reasonably seriously, seriously. up to a point. Up to a point. I, I think I know what you're about to bring up. Yeah, there, there are a race of giant sentient ducks because well, they're not. Giant, they're, they're, they're like shorter than a human, but Sorry. they are in fact sentient ducks. Yeah, yeah. because with arms and legs, someone decided and webbed feet that, that they wanted Donald Duck slash uh, Howard the Duck yep. the Barbarian in the, in the game. Yes. Yeah, well, they they the ducks go all the way back to the original Dragon Pass board game, where they were, where their the initial settlement of Duck Point was delineated, and they appeared in the the defending Satterite Battalion as three counters: ducks, more ducks, and even more ducks. <laughs> And they are, yeah, they're, they're canonical. RuneQuest. Some people love them, some people hate them. Uh, I have a friend that when we did a bit of RuneQuest role playing, the moment I said, and there are ducks, he said, Ooh, I'm going to be a duck. Yep. In fact, Trevor Mallard. <laughs> 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 and some people refuse to play in Glorantha purely because ducks aren't taking it seriously enough, like, you know. This is a game about pretending to be elves and casting magic. It's it is, there's room for everything. Yeah, and, and characteristically, um, for f- in a very what feels like a very Glorantha move, ducks have this kind of complex place in the cosmology yes. where they're deeply tied to the power of the death, death room. room. Yes, yes, and and killing them is held to be bad very, luck to kill a duck. It's yeah, a, it's an Orlanthi folk saying. So, I mean, you know, it's a fascinating interplay where, where there's this thing that's clearly there because it, at least partly because it's it funny. Tickles, yeah, it tickles people's fancy, or but, some people. But it, it, but it's also then folded back in in this very kind of... Uh, it has, it, yeah, it has its serious moments. It's the, the um, they don't know whether ducks are, were originally humans that were cursed or birds that were cursed. They just know that somewhere in there, there's a curse. So, um, all that aside, uh, we we were kind of looking at some of the other things that you've got with you because you you've got uh, some I'm, props. You've got some props. So the, there's a number of uh, miniatures which I'll, I'll make sure to get a photo of so people can see them. There's a, a book that I can't see the cover of because it's currently a, a table of troll types. Yeah. Um, and and a, a couple of other books as well. So do you, do you want to maybe talk a bit about those? What's what's okay. the troll one for well, starters? The troll. This is one of three books that was released as troll pack in the early nineteen eighties, and this was 
absolutely apocalyped in role playing in general because it, it took what was an adversarial race, the trolls, and it turned them into like living, breathing characters. It delineates their history, it delineates their society, it delineates their culture. Um, they're matriarchal. They like they they're very unlike humans because they came from a totally different place from humanity. They came from under, yeah, you know, under Glorantha, from the underworld, a place they called Wonderhome, and um, that was all thrown into chaos when um, all anth. Took <laughs> Eddie is first, gesturing yeah, with a miniature the on the table. Took the first sword and killed Yelm, the sun. This plunging Glorantha into the great darkness. Now, when Yom was killed, he went to hell, also known as the underworld. The trolls didn't like that because they'd never had light before. And it affected them so badly that they mass migrated to the surface where they've stayed ever since. And as they're one of the elder races, when they got to the surface, they immediately started conquering everything in sight. Um, this got them offside with the dwarves, because trolls find dwarves very delicious, and the elves, because the trolls ate a whole bunch of elvish forests. And this has started like conflicts that continue all through Glorantan history and into the Third Age, which is where the majority of, um, of Glorantan games are set. And uh, to continue on that, um, eventually Orlanth decided that killing the sun was probably not the sharpest idea he'd ever had. So he organised a group of other deities and he went and he rescued Yelm, who wasn't grateful at all. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's really cool because it's an approach to an antagonistic faction which... I mean, I would see that as a mark of the big boom of more story-focused games yes. in the 1990s. Yes. That's how, for example, Vampire would, uh, Vampire the Masquerade would introduce the Sabbat as this kind of force of chaos that upset the character's plans, but then release yeah. a book that explains what the, the Sabbat are yeah. actually on about and makes them seem like in some ways they're actually the more reasonable well, group, of, yeah, yeah, group well, of undead. Not, they're not necessarily as random as all that, mm. although they are still pretty random. Um, and and also, you know, you were able to immediately tell me a now in the beginning, oh best yes. beloved type story oh, yes. that explained where this thing came from. That's really cool. And relate them together and they all relate it's like i've got another figurine here the red goddess she is the goddess of the moon uh, in the third age her and all anth are butting heads because the moon lives in the middle air and that's all anth's domain and they don't get on yeah because so there's i mean there's the 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 thing that's introduced as the kind of central political con uh, conflict in glorantha in this the the time period where they suggest that you play is between the Satyr Empire, the Orlanthi worship, the, the literally mm. the Orlanth, the people of Orlanth, and the Lunar Empire. Yeah, the um, the who was a who what which was a solar worshipping, Yelm worshipping empire that was conquered by the forces of the Moon, which ha which exists in time. Um, the the lunar the main lunar goddess is notable that in that she was like split into seven different parts and then reintegrated within time and then she bundled a whole bunch of earth around herself and rose into the air uh, pissing all hands off almightily <laughs> And uh, and starting off uh, the the conflict, which is the primary um, game that most RuneQuest campaigns are based on, in Dragon Pass, where the Lunar Empire has come and it's basically done a Roman Empire on the local Orlanthi tribes. So uh, the other the other thing then that you've got sitting on the table, I'm I'm guessing talks a bit about that, which is yes, this book, the, King, the of, King Sata. of Sata. Yeah, it's a, a historical novel. It's uh, uh, subtitled "The Mystery of Argrath: How One Man Became a God." But um, this is also Greg Stafford being having a bit of fun. I mean, it's uh, if, if you must be familiar with Joseph Campbell. Yes, and the hero's yep. path. This is very much derived from from the hero's path. It's like there are many Argraths, and together they form a, a comp, a sort of a composite entity that was able to achieve godhood, or a reasonable facsimile thereof. 
and kick the snot out of the Lunar Empire. Um, it's a, an interesting read. It's it's both it's it's non within the Garanthian ethos. It's non-fiction, but it is a novel. <laughs> It's uh, and it's just and there are just it's just full of interesting little snippets and I could like pick out so I, I I couldn't pick just one yeah you, you know, it would I'll just open it at random yeah here we go day one preparation it starts with the law speaker making a statement then the trickster throws some beer on the ground a sacred area is marked off an outer guard is designated and sent out a perimeter is marked no one leaves that area until the ritual is done so there we have we have the the, the formal ritual but we also have the trickster element coming in yeah yeah so i mean that's that's uh and of course trickster is stolen the whole cloth of trickster is stolen from like american indian myth yeah, or I mean, the, the, it's not unique to there necessarily. That the concept of the divine trickster that's um, that well, that crops up in many places. Stafford wasn't afraid to borrow ideas, shall hmm. we say, <laughs> that wherever they seemed useful. So, do you know much about um, Stafford and his practice as a as a shaman? Because I mean, that seems to be his kind of major project, aside from being highly committed to this one really, really, really specific fantasy setting that just kind of gets more specific to as tell, it goes along. To tell the truth, I don't. Um, I, um, I do know that he lived in Northern California in the, the town of Arcata, which for various other reasons I follow the adventures of on the interwebs because the world is a strange and twisted thing. But um, no, no, I, all I knew is that he was very devoted to his shamanism. In fact, he uh, he died in his sweat lodge in 2018. <laughs> Wow, that, you, that's you quite. You don't get much more Californian shaman than that. No, you don't. You don't. That's um, that's quite recent as well. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, he's a um, he he. I, I do know that he studied myth and legend, and that's where he got into the whole concept of of using Glorantha to tie all of these threads together. The other th kind of dot I'd like to join maybe is that. Um, they were th that uh, RuneQuest kind of passed through a few different hands yes. um, in in its very very long history because the newest RuneQuest thing that was published was published in 2018 as yes. well. Yeah, and um, back in the hands of Chaosium again. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the entities that it was tied up with for a while was Avalon Hill. Oh, yes, they. Um, they that was the the RuneQuest three, the third edition, which is probably the most mechanically complex version of the game because it includes things like fatigue points. Yeah. So if you didn't like the the mechanics of RuneQuest, you're really not going to like RuneQuest three very much. Uh, I the the, the but, re um, yeah the Avalon Hill was quite an interesting stage in RuneQuest's development because um, it. It turned out that uh, that Greg Stafford kept Glorantha but sold RuneQuest. Right. Yeah, I can I can see how that why that's the thing that you would do, but it's a uh, it's a strange way um, of going about it. Yeah. Yes. Well, the Chaosium did go through a, a long sort of fallow patch, shall we say, where it didn't do a lot, but. Um, it, the main Chaosium product um, these days is, of course, Call of Cthulhu, which is based on the RuneQuest system, but drives off the HP Lovecraft um, novels and stories. Yeah, I was going that, that particular mythos. I was going to say that that is the other thing that that's in fact that's the main thing that a lot of people would know know Chaosium for, and and the reason that uh, Avalon Hill um, pricked up my ears when I saw that name go past uh, is that. Uh, they are the people who published the um, kind of relentlessly. How would you describe it? The the highly unforgiving nineteen seventies board game based on the Dune. Uh, oh, brilliant! Books. Yes, yes, I've played uh, Dune. Yeah, yeah. Which which um, it, it's a. Uh, it, is a thing. Is yeah, definitely a thing. It, it, 
it's very unforgiving. <laughs> Curse them, Benny Gesserit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that's that was an interesting place for it to end up. I thought, and, and I mean, it's, yes. it makes sense that they are the people who would uh, who would push the mechanics uh, up by that much. Yes, and they do, they also, um, in fact, because they couldn't set the material in Glorantha, they had to invent other settings for it, but none of them worked as well as Glorantha because it, did, it didn't like you know, grip people the way it's, there was no, you, you have to buy into the setting. And with Glorantha, there was so much material that you could just, and it was rich. It's like, you know, you, one of the, the the classic places to adventure in Glorantha is Pavis and the Big Rubble. Pavis is a small um, frontier town and it's set just outside this area known as the Big Rubble and in the Big Rubble there is adventure and there is treasure and there are like dungeon like structures but there are also trolls and elves and dwarves all crammed in there together and in order to get in there you have to get an adventuring license from the lunar authorities it's it's yeah. just like it's just everything yeah yeah and and it gives you uh, a reason a rationale that you yep. would go on adventure. Um, you know, this is this is a thing that people do to to accumulate money, but also personal power. But also, you could be a member of a of a cult or a church yep. um, who will send you to do this because they really want to end up with a, with a pet rune lord who can break reality in yes. their favor. Yes, well, we haven't even mentioned hero questing yet. No, no, which sorry. is something which isn't really discussed in the Rune Quest book, but it is a vital part of Glorantha, and that is when people go from the Earth into the mythic world and interact with the gods and their stories, uh, usually to um, to like recreate a specific instance from a god's story and try and gain powers and abilities from that, but. Um, there was a group of people known as the God Learners who figured out how to balk the process and um, and play with the gods. This did not end well for them. No, I bet. But it's a, a fascinating concept, which once again, um, very few other role playing systems even contemplate allowing people to go and literally dick with the gods. Well, quite. I mean, that and and that's a very. That's a concept that strikes me as as particularly informed by by Greg Narrative, Stafford's yep. shamanism because that's um, in at least in some conceptions mm -hmm. what a shaman does is that they they Go intercede with the other world yeah yeah and and they will um, project themselves into particular mythic spaces and times and and interact with particular personalities in order to get stuff back into the really real world yes. for everybody else or or for their own personal power. Well, in RuneQuest terms, that means bringing back spirits and presenting them to people as pets. But that's what they do. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, look, this has been a fascinating chat, Eddie. Uh, what I like to do by way of finishing the podcast off, because we are getting close, close to time, to it, yes. is... Uh, First, uh, I like to ask people if they have any other recommendations. So if people are, are interested in, in Glorantha and RuneQuest, what would you suggest they go and find? I, I've there got... is a website called The Well of Daliath. Okay. Which is a, a good source of information on Glorantha um, in particular. But also Chao the Chaosium website, uh, because they're the, the current publishers of... I think the the current version is role playing in Glorantha. Okay, yeah. Is the, but there is also a RuneQuest six, which sort of splits the system away from Glorantha. If you're interested in a, a, a useful playable system that's been developed, I guess over thirty years now, mm, mm. and it plays it plays well. But um, yeah, also there, there are yeah. Um, Trying to think of other other sides. Well, RPG Net is always good for yeah. anything role playing related. The 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 two things that I was going to suggest is that there is this web comic that we mentioned the of Sata. called The Prince of Sata. Which now, is, it it does have you know some nudity and things in it, so so be appraised yeah. of that. But uh, it 
it's a story set within the world of Glorantha and its mythology um, entirely. And uh, and that's, that's a good pointer if you want to have an idea of what actually is going on in Glorantha. Yeah. It hasn't been updated for a while. Is I, my I, codicil for that? I hadn't checked it yeah. for a while, so I wasn't aware of that. Um, also, because Glorantha is so specific and unique, uh, until you kind of get the vibe of Prince of Sata, so, yeah. it can be a wee bit impenetrable. Yes. Um, the other thing that I would suggest, if you like the idea of an entirely unique uh, world with fascinating concepts to it, that and you're prepared to deal with something that's a bit impenetrable, there is a more recent role-playing game called Mechanical Dream, okay. which is, I think, Quebecois? Like it's okay. it's it's definitely from some francophone country yeah. because the version that I uh, that my friend had that I read w- had been translated into English from French. Right. Um, it's a world in which everyone lives in enormous trees because the ground is incredibly dangerous. Um, the livable bit of the world is surrounded by a wall of darkness called the Sof that no one can penetrate. Okay. And there are no human equivalent races. Oh, nice. So there are all of these different yep. groups of, of sentient creatures living together, but none of them are your single human reference point. Cool. So it's very strange to get your nice. to get your I'm, head around. I'm writing that down. I'm gonna, I should look into that. Yeah, yeah. I, I would I would recommend it yep. with the the um, caveat that that it is. So seriously on the impenetrable side in terms of <laughs> kind of working out what your motivation for doing anything would be once you yes. once you get into well, the game that's player de- that's player derived it is it is the other thing about mechanical dream is that there is um uh, a pendulum i think that a spiritual pendulum that moves through the world during the night time and leaves madness in its wake um, mm. So when people are dreaming, everyone goes crazy, and then in the morning they all come back to themselves. <laughs> oh, nice! And things yeah. happen. It's a it's a okay, very strange that sounds thing. Fascinating. Uh, the other thing that I discovered for other reasons, but I'll just mention: if people want to to stick their head into obscure role playing games and find stuff um, without necessarily being able to get their hands on the physical things, because I imagine. Copies of, of this age of RuneQuest book are, are not too easy to come by. Um, there is a site called The Trove, Trove yes. um, which has just screeds of scans of, of old role-playing stuff. Yes, there is a, an immense amount of RuneQuest material there. Yeah, so obviously if you can buy things legitimately, yeah. do that. But but if you want to find stuff and you're having a hard time, check out The Trove and see what you can get. Yeah. Um, the last thing I like to do is, Eddie, plug your shit. What do you have on the internet that people could get or listen to or watch that well, is yours? I do the audio archive. Brilliant. On NPR. We do the, well, we're 8 o'clock on Saturday nights. That's the one. There's that- always something a bit different on the audio archive. That's uh, me and my friends Matt and Glenn and our combined record record collections, mostly vinyl. And in fact, Matt was the was the most recent guest on um, on reserved recommendations yes. as well, talking about the the strange noisy music of of nineties Palmerston North. Mm. And and, um, and also, I'd like to plug the Film Society. Oh yes, do we're that. Just, unfortunately, we're coming up to the end of the run for this year's Film Society, but consider us for next year. It's um, it, there's. There's some good films. There's always good films. Brilliant. On the big screen as nature intended. Wonderful. And just a, a final point. If you if you are listening from out of town and you can't listen in on the uh, terrestrial radio, you can find the podcast of the audio archive at mpr.nz forward slash show forward slash audio archive and, and get the podcast Excellent. there. Thank you, Hugh. Well, thank you very much, Eddie. You've been listening to Reserved Recommendations, a radio show and podcast from Manawatu People's Radio, Te Reo Irurangi o Matangata o Manawatu. The show is produced and presented by me, Hugh Dingwall, and I also composed our theme music. It's called Sack Jazz, and you can find it at wolfboy.bandcamp.com. You can find me on the internet at Objective Realty on Twitter, and you can find the show on Facebook under Reserved Recommendations. Recommendations. If you've got a reserve 
deserved recommendation of your own feel free to pitch it to me in either of those two places and if you enjoyed the show why not go ahead and recommend it to a friend you can find past episodes at www.mpr.nz forward slash show forward slash reserved on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and remember One or Two People's Radio is a non-profit radio station if you enjoy this or any of their other fine audio programming why not fling them a couple of dollars go to npr.nz forward slash donate for more information Thank you.